Welcome to you all. This is Behind the Music, London Symphonia series of pre-concert chats. My name is Andrew Chung. I'm artistic producer of London Symphonia. And this is ahead of our concert called Beyond Tears and Laughter. Today, I am joined by uh, Sean Spicer. Hello, Sean. Hey, guys. I'm joined by Angela Schwartzkopf. Hello, Angela. And, Ro and Ron George. Hey, Ron. Hello. So I'll just give a little uh, introduction to these three amazing people. And we do have amazing musicians uh, with London Symphonia. So first of all, uh, Sean Spicer, originally from Nova Scotia. I've got to put that in there. He's got degrees from McGill and Yale. Uh, he's worked with musical organizations across Canada, from Symphony Nova Scotia to Calgary Bass Foothills Brass Quintet to the west coast of Vancouver um, in, in 19. 99, Sean was appointed Principal Trumpet of Orchestra London, and where he played for 15 years and now proudly continues to perform as a member of London Symphonia. He's also on the Artistic Advisory Council. He plays a wide, he's played a wide variety of concerti and solo works over the years. He loves to play uh, Baroque and Renaissance music on original instruments. <clears throat> Performances on uh, Baroque trumpet and cornetto have taken him as far away as Brazil and Japan. He's played with Tapa Music, Studio de Musique Ancienne de Montréal, the Santa Fe Early Music Society, and the Teatro Municipal de Rio de Janeiro. Yay! He's active as an educator, and since 2003, Sean has taught trumpet at Western University. Uh, Ron George, <clears throat> horn player extraordinaire, an active musician uh, in a variety of roles, from teacher to soloist, chamber musician, and orchestral player. He's held the position of Principal Horn with London Symphony and Orchestra London since 1979 and has appeared as soloist with the orchestra many times. Uh, born in San Francisco, he's performed with a list that is so long, it's basically every orchestra <laughs> in Southern Ontario for sure. Uh, absolutely extraordinary. Um, and he's a com committed chamber musician. Uh, he's appeared at the Ottawa Chamber Music Festival, the West Bend Arts Festival, and has collaborated frequently with many um, London colleagues uh, presenting chamber music in and around London and at Western University. He's a dedicated teacher, um, teaching many of the next generation of horn players at Western University. Um, and now we've got to Angela Schwarzkopf. So Angela, with her 2020 Juno Award for Classical Album of the Year, uh, Angela became the first harpist to receive the award in 25 years, joining fellow Canadian harp icons Erica Goodman and Judy Lohman. Uh, Angela is the first harpist to receive a doctorate of music in harp performance in Canada. And she now teaches at a number of esteemed institutions. She's also a founding member of the Topaz duo with flutist Kylie Mimitz. And Kylie, of course, is the former principal flute of Orchestra London. Um, she works, uh, Angela works regularly with the top choral and orchestral organizations throughout the, through the area, including National Arts and Orchestra and Hamilton Phil and KW Symphony and of course, London Symphonia. She's um, a large advocate for new music, worked on commissioning projects with many prominent composers and her debut album, Detached was all Canadian new music featuring uh, several compositions by Monica Pierce, Alicia Denberg, Kevin Lau, and Mark Narenberg. She's a frequent uh, contributor to the international publication Harp Column, and she serves on the editorial board of the American Harp Journal, and now serves as second vice president and director at large of the American Harp Society. Welcome to you all. Hey, Andrew. <laughs> hey. Thanks. I'm exhausted. That's a lot. <laughs> You're all so accomplished. Okay. Okay. This is great. Um, and and I would I would note that we're calling you a special <clears throat> guest, Angela. Um, probably because of the Juno swag. But 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 it's you are really one of us. You've appeared with London Symphony on so many occasions, just bringing a beautiful sound to a concert. So we're we're grateful to have you along for this particular concert. Sean, so you're largely responsible for bringing together uh, this one, uh, selecting music, even the musicians who are performing. Uh, what's it all about? Well, this, uh, this concert uh, allows us to showcase 
uh, some of the instruments in a chamber setting that we have don't always see. Um, we often get string quartets and Widwin quintets, uh, but this brings in a, a few different um, uh, instruments uh, like harp, um, trumpet, uh, trombone too. And so again, these are things that, uh, these are instruments that uh, don't make frequent appearances in the kind of chamber music that we have been doing uh, in these uh, London Symphonia concerts. And uh, we were able to do this uh, through a couple pieces. The one, the Debussy Trio for harp, viola, and flute. And we're fortunate as brass players to have this great uh, Poulenc piece, uh, Poulenc being one of the few sort of canonical or well-known composers to have written chamber music for brass. And he has done this trio for brass. And then we kind of uh, have these two pieces and uh, to sort of fill it out, we've taken uh, some well-known and beloved uh, uh, music by some other French composers to, uh, to bring us all together to play some, some more beautiful music. And uh, I mean, that's basically it. It's just, it's, it was just about sort of spreading, spreading the, uh, the joy a little bit to, to more musicians. Now, the, the composers on this particular program are, we would call impressionist composers. Uh, what does it mean? <laughs> oh gosh, I wish you hadn't asked me that question. <laughs> 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 Anyone can chime in. It's open yes. season. <laughs> Please, does send, anybody else have ideas about that? <laughs> well, Impressionism is such a, has such a lengthy description and so many meanings to it that it is such a, like a complicated answer to give. And, and it's also compounded by the fact that many of the composers that we label as Impressionists didn't actually like approve of that label um but it all impressionism all stems from um monet's artwork and it originally being labeled as impressionistic who he also did not want that label associated with his music but when i'm playing impressionistic music i'm thinking i think about sort of not even really what that term means, but I think about the details on the page more than anything else, because I think what was happening at the time that we have these impressionistic composers was that they were notating on music more than ever before what they actually wanted their music to sound like, the performers to do. More dynamics, more um, expressive indications, more tempo indications, all those things. And so when I think of impressionism, I often think of like all the tiny little details that make up the beautiful whole that we get from them um, without getting into an actual definition of impressionism. That's sort of mm -hmm. what I think of. Yeah, I, th I, I think of it as, you know, music is, it's so, it's so colorful. It's so, um, you know, it's just a great soundscape that, that comes, that comes across and it's, you know, John, you and I were talking that it's uh, French music often gets forgotten. You know, we, we think of uh, chamber music and, you know, we think of Beethoven, Beethoven and Mozart and and that's mm -hmm. great. But you've got this whole other soundscape with these, um, you know, impressionist French, French composers. I yeah. often uh, think about or when I hear French music, when I hear Debussy, when I hear Ravel, um, it's yeah. I, it's it's always this idea. I, I I have. I think. Oh yeah. This this is actually my favorite music. You know. You mm. you. We've got these other sort of German composers: Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, Austrian. You know. It's and then. But but really, um, when it comes right down to it, Ravel uh, has this sort of uh, penetrating quality. It just it speaks to, speaks to us on a different level, I think, and uh, uh, really kind of uh, ma manages to kind of transport us in, in ways, in unique ways, I think. And your favorite piece, your favorite uh, piece. I have, a, I do have a favorite piece, which is somewhat unlike me. I'm generally a little sort of wishy-washy, but you know, when it comes right down to it, I love, 
uh, this the second movement of the Ravel Piano Concerto in G. It's just just a, a just such a gorgeous thing. And you know, I think one of the things that um, yeah, Ravel uh, had was was profoundly affected by the First World War, and in that movement, I just think that you can really um, hear the 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 sadness and the uh, the um, just the way that that he was uh, um, affected by by that what what he and and his generation went through. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. I'm I want to go back to 2020. You won the Juno Award, Angela. I was absolutely <laughs> floored when I heard the news. I thought it was absolutely amazing. We were we were cheering yeah. along. We, oh, we got a little bit of echo going on. Um, uh, but anyway, it was awesome. And uh, congratulations and congratulations <laughs> again. Um, so what was that like? Can you just tell us? I don't speak to many Juno winners. <clears throat> it was probably the weirdest experience of my life. Um, truly because of the whole, um, you know, just the way it was presented, like it, it was online, right. Um, or it was streamed via, I think CBC jam is how I watched it. Um, yeah, which was like, you know, I wasn't at an actual event. Uh, so that was really strange. And, um, obviously I knew it had been nominated, but I didn't know, like they didn't, tell us ahead of time any who the winners were that's a question I get a lot was like well did you know ahead of time I'm like no I really did not know um oh I didn't know that so you're, no. you're listening to the presentation and it was it was a live reveal wow. yes so I was like an extreme ball of nerves like the entire day um like about an hour before the show, I think my husband put a drink in my hand and was like, just relax, you're gonna be fine. And we found out the order of the presentation and I knew that they were doing my category like two or three from the end. And so I was like, oh great, I get to, I get to be nervous for even longer, this is wonderful. And I was just like totally freaking out. And, and um, actually my husband was like so funny cause he was like, I think we should videotape your reaction. And I'm like, it's just gonna be a reaction of me losing. <laughs> don't do that. And then he did it anyhow. <laughs> so I have this like super hilarious video of me just screaming for like <laughs> ever. And then, and then at the end of that, I was like, wait, they did say my name, right? <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, I hope that video went viral. I can find that after this interview. That's Oh, it is. It is on my Instagram. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Wow, that's so, hilarious. That's hilarious. Uh, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm sure it was just such a huge moment. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was massive. It was totally surreal. It was, yeah, it's, it's amazing. It still feels, in a lot of ways, not real. I totally have my Juno like on my desk with me, and I see it I'm looking at it right now, and I'm just sort of like, yeah, that that is a thing that happened. Like, that's that's awesome. Yeah, that's me. You know. <laughs> Uh, that it, it's just it's just really great and it's just great validation from you know, your, your peers about the amazing work and uh, original work that you're mm -hmm. that you're you're bringing about and uh, uh, just wanted to go back in time for a moment all the good stuff yeah, <laughs> definitely like you know it was like it's for me it was the greatest thing that happened in 2020 you know it was 2020 actually was for me not a bad year not a bad year <laughs> yeah that's great. Okay, let's get Ron talking. So Ron, um, I'm thinking <laughs> chamber music, <clears throat> um, the horn. Uh, tell me about it. What, what, like, does the horn have much to play chamber music wise out there? And, uh, uh, you know, tell me, tell me, tell me about what, what there's, what there's to play. You see, you see I'm at the back of the orchestra and I don't get a chance to talk very much. So this is kind of new for me, but I'll, I'll do my best, but um, well, there, the history of brass chamber music in particular, um, the, the, um, and going directly to this concert with a trio, you see the, the instruments are, there, there's many more instruments. Um, if we think, actually we think back last year, um, Sean, we did that brass concert with was about a dozen players. And um, mm -hmm. actually one of the words that keeps coming back is curating. Mm -hmm. All these concerts that 
the Symphonia put on are, um, are specially built. Like each one is tailor made, and um, it's am it's amazing how the each theme um, is is it, like it's a, a specific theme for each concert. Um, for horn and, and um, chamber music, there's there's actually quite a bit. There's a woodwind quintet which the horn's involved with, and the brass quintet. So right away, there's probably about an equal number of both of those genres of music. So the horn has about twice as many um, pieces to play as, say, the trumpet. Um, oh, Sean. The, bra the brass. <laughs> so, the, but this, is, this is kind of interesting that the, this tree, the Poulenc trio, um, I don't know, there's, a, there's a also the, a, exactly the same instrumentation that Ian McDougall wrote, uh, teaches a uh, jazz trombone player. And there's, there's a Nelly Bell, there's, there's a bunch of, of pieces that, that don't get programmed that much, but. Um, so was it that but, there are sometimes these, these seminal rambling. pieces like the WC, the, this tr the, the, the one for harp and, and flute and, and viola. And then there's uh, the Poulenc trio. And then, so there's these, these, these kind of um, you know, signpost pieces and then uh, other composers compose stuff to go with that. It's a little bit like that, right? So, um, and maybe that goes the, in the same way for, for horn. Um, as you said, there's not much trumpet chamber music that you can pull off the shelf, but- uh, I was gonna say, um, mm -hmm. I was gonna say um, Poulenc also, um, uh, wrote a piece for a um, horn player named Dennis Brain. He's probably the greatest horn player that, and he um, he died on uh, September twenty uh, first, uh, September first, um, nineteen fifty seven. Kind of stumbling a bit here, being in the front now, but um, <laughs> the, the, and he 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 was uh, he was coming back from a concert he, um, in Edinburgh and driving to London, and he he cra the car crashed. And he was 36 years old. And um, the day after that ha happened, Poulenc um, started to write an elegy for Dennis Brain. Mm -hmm. And it was performed exactly um, September 1st, 1958. So one year after that accident with Poulenc at the piano and Neil Saunders was playing horn who played along with Dennis Brain. Mm -hmm. So there was, there's a mm -hmm. kind of, the, he, yeah, it was a, it's a very special, special piece that horn players play a lot. Um, I thought I may, might mention that that one that might be of interest. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, in this concert, we have a few arrangements, and and they've been created by Sh by Sean, and that's so as to bring the the three and the three together, right? So that all six of you have something to play. So. Um, what is what is that? Um, what is that music, Sean? That's oh right. Well, we're going, we're going. Two of the pieces are from uh, this uh, Debussy uh, piano work called uh, Sweet Burger Mask, and it's uh, in, it includes probably one of Debussy's most famous pieces, Claire de Lune, mm -hmm. and all all of these pieces have been um, uh, arranged in such a great variety of ways it's 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 actually so it's it's really in the tradition of uh of of what's what sort of happened to all of these uh, all of these pieces um over the past hundred years like everyone wants yeah. a, everyone wants a chunk of this amazing evocative music right exactly exactly mm -hmm. in our particular case i mean it was really interesting um to to sort of take that on we've got you know two groups of instruments that are uh, in some ways not uh wouldn't normally sort of come together uh and it's not because any one of the instruments that flute of of flute harp and viola are incapable of playing loud. Um, it's just that uh, uh, you know we we don't brass just has a different sort of direct kind of sound, and uh, it's a challenge to sort of bring these together. Um, and also the other challenge is um, that uh, uh, well we've got it's I was one of the things that I found was that uh, there were the bass, like 
establishing the base. We've got the trombone uh, and we've got the lower end of the harp, but there's, there's, there's a lot of middle to the uh, and upper, it seems, in this group. And so sometimes it was a challenge to kind of find a way to, to uh, um, get that lower end full enough, you know, or not too full. Again, it's just, it's, it's a matter of balance. I think what we'll be doing, especially on the brass side, is uh, experimenting with muting a little bit as well. So, and I think we'll find that we have to do some adjusting when we... And, and that's pretty interesting. I mean, brass players um, by, by reputation and by their nature are a little louder. Mm. Um, a, a, oh, except for Ron George, he's not like a loud mouth guy. But, <laughs> but in the orchestra balance of sound, um, right? It's, it's not like, like, okay, well, you might have eight, you know, eight first violins, but, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, two trumpets. Um, mm -hmm. That's the kind of balance that you're you're dealing with. But then in a, a chamber music context, that's right. So you got to use mutes, and you've got to be working and always thinking about that balance and how it's coming across. Um, yeah, that's 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 really interesting. That's really really interesting. We'll um, see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> we shall see how it goes. Um, t okay, so uh, tell me a little bit about this uh, WC piece, Angela. Um, can you tell me, I, I, I know you're pretty excited about it. Um, is this something that's in your pocket? Like you've played this numerous times or you've coached it or? Yeah, I have performed it several times and I, I have coached it actually. So yes, I, <laughs> I'm quite familiar with it. So every time I pull it out and start playing it, it feels like I'm visiting an old friend. It's, it feels so good to play. Oh, so it's that. a great piece. I love that. Um, but it's it's such a important important for a lot of reasons and it was really interesting to hear you guys talk about how maybe French chamber music for your instruments kind of gets a little pushed aside in favor of you know chamber music by Beethoven or others but for us as harpists it's like French that's our stuff like the French mm. chamber music and I think that has to do really with the development of the harp um Throughout history, we've had, you know, the harp wasn't always what you see behind me. It really developed and it grew and it actually came to be the instrument that I you, you do see behind me in the early 20th century when we have people like Debussy writing for harp. So I think that's why chamber music of this time and specifically the Debussy Trio is so important to us because it was written for the instrument that we actually play today. Um, when I think of something like the Mozart Flute and Harp Concerto, it is still an like, incredibly important work for us. And, and mostly, be, you know, we didn't have a lot written for us. And the fact that's the only thing that Mozart wrote for us, but it was actually written for what's called a single action pedal harp that would have been a smaller instrument and it had uh, less capabilities to play in different keys. And so the harp that we have today, the harp that really came into its own in this time period um, is, is the one that, you know, the WC trio is written, written for, and it really showcases this instrument to its fullest capabilities. That's amazing. So really, you're, uh, is it too much to say that, that, um, that this trio, this sonata for, for trio, um, it, it forms the, the foundation of harp sound for like the last hundred years? Um, I mean, it's definitely a part of it, mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, th you know, there were, in, in the harp world, we have sort of other seminal early 20th century harpist composers that help sort of formulate our sound. Um, but Debussy was definitely among them. And I love that, like, I love thinking about this time period and how all these French composers were like living in France and living in Paris would, you know, get to know each other and work with each other and collaborate on stuff. Um, I did my, this is where I'm going to get really nerdy. I did my doctoral research on a French harpist composer from the early 20th century called Marcel Tournier. And I actually uh, did quite a bit of research in France. And when I was, you know, doing my research on Tournier, I ended up finding a letter that Debussy had written to another harpist of the time talking about his harp part in one of his orchestral works and asking the harpist if it was okay and what he thought about it. I just love how like 
close and collaborative all these people were. And I love hearing these stories. Like, it's so wonderful. They all worked together to kind of, I don't know, change the scene. It was amazing. I'm sure when you were putting together your, your new CD, though, that um, uh, when you're putting together Detach, that you were in conversation with these composers, right? So Absolutely. Right. We just have this illusion that, uh, you know, it was less communicative back then and they just produced this masterpiece. But of course, there were conversations. There was deep conversations and, um, you know, it's part of what created the success, I'm sure, and the enduring quality of it. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you know what? We've run out of time for today. <laughs> That's our behind the music for this for this for this edition. So thank you so much, Sean and Angela and Ron, for joining me today. 